This podcast is sponsored by Safe House Rehab Thailand, the premier drug and alcohol rehab dedicated to enhancing the science of recovery. First, a plug for my sponsor, who has given me the opportunity to help the families and loved ones of alcoholics and addicts better understand the nature of the disease and what they can and shouldn't do about it, shouldn't try to do about it. We say in our podcast and blog that our primary goal is to help you make an informed decision at this critical stage of your life. Safe House Rehab Thailand represents the modern approach to recovery, founded on safety, which is why we absolutely outperform traditional rehabs when it comes to intake and detox, technology, and aftercare. To learn more about our modern, advanced approach to recovery, we invite you to visit safehouserehab.com or send your questions and comments to info at safehouserehab.com. Hi, this is Bruno J. And today I wish to challenge anyone who cares about a struggling addict or alcoholic to start on the journey of liberation. And if you yourself are struggling with addictive disorder and or alcoholism, they are essentially the same in any case, then this essay may give you the hope and guidance you might need to make the turn in the right direction. So let us start with what the word chaos means, and what the concept of chaos implies in a more complete sense for family members who care for a suffering addict or alcoholic. The primary definition of chaos is, according to the dictionary.com, a state of utter confusion or disorder, a total lack of organization or order. So let's unpack that definition. Note that disorder and lack of organization or order describe the condition. Next, notice how the words utter and total convey the absolute nature of that condition. A lack means an absence of something. It means there is a vacuum. So what has filled that vacuum? This is where we describe the life experience of many who care for a loved one who has become a full-blown addict and or alcoholic, or is trying to get clean or an early recovery. And remember that these days, cross-addictions are the rule as opposed to the exception. It's called polyaddiction, addicted to many substances, including alcohol in some cases. Imagine a typical but more or less a worst-case scenario often described as desperate codependency. Perhaps you are already there. And the chances are that if a U-turn isn't made, you may find yourself stuck in a nightmare. And it may take years to get there. The disease is decidedly progressive. That is, it always gets worse without exception. So you may end up in a place you don't deserve to be in. A real-life example of desperate codependency looks like this. Alice and her husband Mike had been trying for years to get their one and only golden boy to get clean and sober. They started by enabling his drug abuse without really realizing it. Alice continues her story. Our son's grades in college took a nosedive in his junior year, and when we asked why, he said it was because his girlfriend ran off with another guy to California. We bought that explanation. We did have a few questions, however, but he was vague about it, so we left it alone. What we didn't know at the time was that he had started injecting heroin after several months of snorting Oxycontin, which was easily able to get on the street. It turned out heroin was cheaper. He dropped out of college after he made three Fs and an incomplete his next semester. So he moved back into our home to regroup. It wasn't long before we noticed that he started sleeping throughout the day, and then he didn't come home back until dawn. Our suspicions aroused. We searched his room and found his stuff paraphernalia, they call it, needles and spoons and such. To his credit, or maybe because he was caught, he admitted that he had a problem. You have to understand he was so dysfunctional after a few months that I wasn't even trying to get a job. We got him into treatment at a local day rehab. There he attended IOP intensive outpatient treatment sessions three days a week, and for some time he stayed clean. Then he decided that he didn't need treatment after all, and that his problem wasn't that bad, and so he took it upon himself to straighten himself out. He actually went out and found himself a job, but that didn't pay enough to pay for his own place, so he continued to live at home. Well, at least he was safe with us, we thought. We couldn't stop his using, but at least he was in our sight. He finally agreed to go back and see a psychiatrist who prescribed drugs for OCD and depression. He took the drugs, but then again dismissed his advice to stop using and abusing the other illegal substances. Our boy was always anxious about something and depressed most days, but the meds didn't address the problem underneath, 
and this we concluded much later, because a psychiatrist wasn't really qualified to diagnose addiction. He decided, our boy decided he needed his privacy. So he built an addition to our house where he had his own bathroom, kitchen, and TV room. Obviously, he couldn't pay rent, so he lived there rent-free and used his money for whatever he wanted, including beer and drugs. This situation lasted until he OD'd one night, but we found him before it was too late. Thank God for the EMTs and the Narcan, which brought him around in a matter of minutes. Finally, my husband said, this kid is sucking up all the oxygen in our lives. It's been nothing but chaos for six years now. I've had it up to here. We had been fighting and worrying over our boy for so long, we were exhausting our last reserves of care. All those dreams of a good life were dashed on the rocks of his addiction. We finally decided to heed the advice of our own son's psychiatrist, who addressed us in a private session. He had, con he had consulted with another colleague, and they had decided that the problem was probably addiction. So he stated that he saw the massive enabling that we were engaged in, and that he had trouble believing that we couldn't see that we had given up our lives for another person's addiction even though it was for our own child. We began to realize that we needed to be liberated from a life of sheer chaos, financial stress, unpredictable hours, late nights, chasing down where the boy was that night, worrying about his safety, worrying about him ODing again. Our mental health was crashing. We finally began to understand that we ourselves were in the grip of our son's disease almost as much as he. The first step in Al-Anon, is admitted we were powerless over alcohol and drugs and that our lives had become unmanageable. So if we were powerless, we ultimately had zero control over the course of our son's disease and we realized that we were delusional in thinking that we did and that we had been enabling him all this time. We were making it easier for him, for his addiction to be fed. It took us many more sessions with our AODA, Alcohol or Drug Addiction Counselor, to whom we were referred, and many Al-Anon meetings to begin the process of liberation, to stop the enabling, to develop a healthy detachment for our son's disease, to not stop loving him, but love him in the right way. Enlightenment came upon us. It was finally time for us to start living, as in doing the things that were good for us, recovering our mental balance and physical health, travel, enjoy each other's company, maybe even fall in love again. The major psychological hurdle we had to overcome was to not feel guilty about turning attention away from his disease and begin to focus on ourselves, each in his or her own way. We started to end our enabling by asking our son to accept treatment yet again. If the answer was no, then we said we were prepared to see him leave the warm confines of his rent-free space and find his own place to live and we were not going to support him with another money, uh, another penny, rather. This informal family intervention, aided by professional advisors, was quite the shock. But a shock was needed to wake him up. An addict changes behavior not because he sees the light, but because he feels the heat. That's what I've learned. He did indeed take it seriously this time and completed a 30-day stay in treatment, which we paid for, of course, and engaged in outpatient therapy for six months while he was working. He went on to finish his education and stayed clean and got a decent entry-level job in IT while attending NA Narcotics Anonymous meetings three times a week. So we wish him well. The disease is no longer stealing our money, our peace of mind, and our sanity, at least for today. That's all we ever get, and we mean to take it. We mean to make the most of it this time. This is the end of chaos as we knew it. So what do we learn from Alice's story? One. A family's journey down the slippery slope toward desperate enabling starts slowly and imperceptibly without the slightest suspicion that there is anything brewing. Two, enabling is well-meaning, but it's misguided because it simply gives the disease the oxygen it craves to keep on thriving. Three, the family deludes itself into believing that it has any power to arrest the disease when the truth is that they are powerless over the ultimate course of a progressive disorder. 4. Chaos will rule the house unless some form of intervention takes place, almost always with the help of a professional trained in addictive disease. 5. When Alice and her husband made the decision that they needed to live their own lives without guilt, did the chaos subside? 
That decision meant that they could finally live happily together one day at a time. Tune in next week for the next episode of Busting Addiction and Its Myths, where we now have our weekly episodes titled by topic for you to search and download at your leisure, all in the interest of busting some myths and bringing you the truth about the face of addiction and alcoholism today.